Hi. We are going to get started now because this is going to be a very packed talk. And launching right into it, I'm Matt Heon, and I am here to talk to you about Podman. So a bit about me. I've been an engineer at Red Hat for the last five years, and I've spent all of those with Dan Walsh over there on the containers team. And I've been working on Podman for about the last three years, basically since the project was conceived of. And I'm one of the lead maintainers on it. So let's start talking about Podman. This is a pretty simple sample Podman command. So you can see we have a volume. We've got a memory limit. We're going to launch a Fedora image. And we're going to run Bash. And all of this came about because Scott McCarty, who I don't think is in the room, but Scott McCarty asked me, what happens when you press Enter on a command like this? And we're going to answer that today. And we're going to trace this command in two different ways. We're going to run it as root, and we're also going to look at what happens when we run it without root. Because those two end up being pretty different. So let's just move on briefly to the architecture of Podman, just an overall view of it. And you'll notice that we have two of them here. We have one for root, and we have one for rootless. And rootless Podman is not a set UID binary which means that we don't really have privileges. We only run with what the user came in with, and for an unprivileged user, we're not going to be able to do a lot of things, which means that we are going to have to do a lot of differently as opposed to root. Now, I'm not going to linger on the architecture here other than to say that everything aside from the attached socket you see over to the left is a separate process. We'll go into more detail on each of these components later, but let's just think about the differences between the root and rootless architectures here. As we move on to the biggest of those differences, the rootless user namespace. This is the big box you saw around the rootless container. So rootless Podman needs a user namespace for two big reasons. The first one is we need to be able to mount some file systems that we might not otherwise. Normally, unprivileged users can't really mount. But within a user namespace, we gain the ability to do bind mounts, Fuse mounts, TempFS mounts, and a few more that are less relevant. But those three are going to be enough to let us establish a container root file system. It's also going to let us get some additional users in play. Because normally, when you log in as an unprivileged user, you have access to one UID, and exactly one UID, your own. But if you pull any container image, you're going to find that there's more than one UID in play. Uh, there are a lot of files that are going to be owned by users other than root. And we really need to support that for the rootless use case. So here, once we create this rootless user namespace using unshare, we are going to have to get the first and only set UID binaries involved, a uh, new UID map and new GID map. And those are going to read Etsy sub UID, Etsy sub UID. You can see those right there. And they're going to grant us some additional users based on that. So you can see my username, mheon, in there. Uh, and it's going to give me 65536 users starting at 100,000. That's the third and the second number, respectively. Makes some sort of sense. But once we have these users in here, we have access to them, and we can use them in the container. So if you want to run a systemd, say, in that rootless container, you're actually able to. And finally, the rootless user namespace gives us the ability to change the users around a bit in terms of ordering. Now, namespaces really are a way of altering the way a process looks at the rest of the system. And in terms of the user namespace, it allows us to remap both in terms of excluding and including users from the host, but also in terms of reordering them. So we are going to take UID 0 in the container, and we're going to make it whoever launched the rootless container. So you're still not going to be root, even though you launch this container. You don't gain any privileges in terms of the kernel. But you can pretend to be root within the container, and that's pretty important. And now, once we've finished setting up this rootless user namespace for the first time, we're actually going to keep it around. Because any subsequent containers, we need to join the namespace as well. Uh, those containers are, if they want to share anything with containers that are already in this namespace, for example, if they want to share namespaces, they all need to be within the same rootless user namespace. So we launch what's called a pause process to keep this alive. And every subsequent pod magnification rootless is going to join this. And again, this is only for rootless. If you're root, you can mount anything you want. You have access to all the users. There is no need for it. 
Now let's move on to the first real step once we're past this, which is pulling the image. And if you've already seen Nolan's talk, he went into more depth on this than I will be able to. Uh, but let's go on anyways and do a bit of a brief overview. So if the image is available locally, we can obviously skip this step. Let's assume that it's not. The first real step is going to be to figure out what we need to pull. If you remember that sample command I showed you, it was your Fedora image. And Fedora is not very descriptive here. We need to figure out what the full name of the image is. And we do this using something called search registries. These are defined in registries.conf. And we're going to use those to generate some potential candidate image names, full names. And you can see those over there. These are, as it would appear, on a standard Fedora 31 system. You can see that there are five potential candidates. And we are going to pull those one by one in that order. First one to pull successfully is the one that we're going to use. And pull in general is just going to be a series of HTTP GET requests. We're going to ask the registry, do you have a manifest for this image? If it does not, we're going to assume it doesn't have the image at all. Go on to the next one. If it does, then we're going to try and pull all the layers of that image. And once we're done pulling them, we are going to save them into container storage. And now we get to actually create the container. So the first step is to parse the CLI of Podman into what we call create config. This is basically a convenient struct that holds all of the changes that you made on the command line, plus some baked in defaults. And once we make that struct, we are going to turn it into an OCI spec. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with the fact that Podman does not directly launch containers itself. It calls something called an OCI runtime. And the way we define the container the OCI runtime is going to build is the OCI spec. And that is going to contain things like the memory limit we concluded. It's going to contain the volume we included. It's going to contain some baked in defaults as well. But there are things that it's not going to contain. The OCI spec, for example, does not care about images. It expects all that to be done before it runs. And it can't care about things like, say, a libpod named volume. If you make a volume with podman volume create, we don't really know enough to make a bind mount for it yet. And the OCI spec also doesn't care about it. So we end up with a bundle here of an OCI spec, but also some things that don't quite fit inside of it. And we're going to pass that bundle into libpod, which is the container creation library used by Podman. All our container operations are managed by libpod. The repo is actually named container slash libpod. And we're going to call create in there. And that's going to save an immutable copy of this uh, container definition, the OCI spec and the things that aren't quite in there. And once we have that saved, the container is created as far as libpod is concerned, but we have one more thing to do. We need to make this container in the storage library. We just pulled down an image, but an image isn't quite a container definition. We also need something on top of it. Images are obviously immutable. You want to share them between multiple containers without making changes to them. But at the same time, the container is not. Uh, if I go into that container, which was running bash, and I touch some files, I want those to show up. So we have a read white layer on top of the container. And that is going to be made by the storage library. But it's not going to be mounted yet. We're just making things. And now we're going to prepare to start the container. Now, if we were running just podman create, we would have halted right there. But we're going to go on. And we're going to call something called start and attach in libpod. And as the name implies, starts the container, attaches the container. That's the remaining work of Podman run. The first step of this is an internal function called init. And init is going to make the container ready to start, but start, stop right before it starts it. First step of init, really, is to get the container mounted. We need to mount it up using overlayfs on root which is basically going to take all those layers that we downloaded from the image, plus that root, uh, top layer we made earlier, and it's going to merge them all into one directory, and we can access that as a container file system. Now, unfortunately, as I said earlier, root doesn't, rootless rather, doesn't have the ability to make many mounts, so we cannot use kernel overlayfs. The solution here is Fuse overlayfs, which was developed by Giuseppe. I think he's in the room. But Fuse overlayfs is a re-implementation of kernel overlay in user space. So we can use it without privileges, which is pretty neat. It's going to do roughly the same thing, but Fuse. 
And then once we've created the file system, we're now going to need to mount the network. Uh, so, or not mount the network, create the network. So the container needs a network namespace, and as root, we're going to use something called the CNI plugin. So if you're not familiar with these, it's a series of binaries that will each perform a separate discrete task. And in typical use, one of them is going to modify system configuration, add the podman network to a bridge. One of them is going to add some IP tables rules so we can forward traffic to and from the container. One of them will handle any port forwarding that we need. And all of these are making big sweeping system changes that, again, we don't have privileges for as rootless. So we are again going to have to work around this, and the solution here is something called slurp for netness. Slurp is a small binary that originated in the vert land. Uh, I believe it was part of libvert at first. And it basically is going to tunnel inside of the container to outside the container. It acts as a manual bridge, so to speak, and lets us forward traffic without directly creating a network interface. It's got its limitations, obviously, but when you run as rootless, when you have no privileges, you have to accept some sacrifices. And then we are going to create some container-specific files because we don't want to use everything in the image as is. The image probably has a resolve.conf, but it is in no way related to the network that's running this container. So we want to take the host resolve, but we also want to be able to change it. You want to be able to alter the container. So we're going to make a copy of the host resolve.conf, and we're going to make it so that this is bind mounted into the container. And then we're going to finalize the OCI spec. Now, we have everything that we didn't have before, because we made it before, but we didn't know where the container was mounted. We didn't know about these extra bind mounts that we've added. We didn't know where the network namespace was. Now that we've finished preparing, we can finalize the spec and write it to disk, and then we can use it to launch Conmon. Conmon is the container monitor, we call it. And you can see a sample Conmon command line right there. And what I want you to take away from this is that you should never, ever invoke Conmon yourself. Let Podman do it for you. Uh, this is basically a very lightweight C binary. And once we fork it off, it's going to double fork to demonize. And once it's finished doing that, uh, yeah. so once it is finished doing that, it is going to provide some services for us. So Podman itself is dangerous, which means that the Podman process can go away at any time. But the container is still running in the background, potentially. And what if I want to do, say, a Podman attached to it? Or what if it exits? I need to get the exit code. Kanban will monitor the container, and it will provide a few services, like attaching to it, if we do a Podman attach. And it's also going to store the exit code for us. And once Podman creates Conmon and Conmon double forks, it has very little to do but invoke the OCI runtime. And the first thing it's going to do is the OCI runtime create command. So what I'm about to say here is true for run C and C run. What it's not true for is CATA, GVisor. There are various other runtimes, and most of them will be hypervisor based. And they will have similar end results, but the steps I'm about to describe, very different. So this applies to run C, C run, whatever your default probably is. Now the OCI create command, basically the OCI runtime create command, is going to make what we call an init process. And that is the larval form of a container. And it's going to start adding security restrictions and setting up what will eventually become the container. It's going to make all the namespaces. We already named, made the network namespace before, but it's going to establish a mount namespace, PID namespace, IPC namespace, for example. And then it's going to finish the root file system. So we mounted the image before, but all the bind mounts, they're going to be handled by this OCI runtime. And then it's going to create its C group. The container has a C group, but this is another place where root and rootless differ. In the C group v1 hierarchy, it's not safe to give a rootless container delegation. It will be able to modify resource limits that were previously passed on it. So it could basically ignore any resource limits. And what that means is, unless you're running C groups v2, we can't really create C groups for the container. Next, we're going to go ahead and we're going to drop our capabilities.
So we probably are not, we are not running a privileged container here, so we're going to drop any capabilities that we don't want to retain. And this actually happens for rootless as well, because rootless established the rootless user namespace, which gave us a set of fake capabilities within it. And we're gonna drop those capabilities. Next, we're going to initialize our security features, seccomp, se Linux, and once that's done, we're basically almost at the container, but we're going to stop here. We're gonna stop right before we execute that first thing in the container, that bash process that we want. And conmon and uh, the OCI runtime are going to signal podman that we're done with this, and then they're gonna to go to sleep and wait for the next step, because there's one more thing that we have to do. And that is, we need to attach to the container. So unless you specify hyphen D, attach is gonna happen. If you do, then we proceed to the next step, we start the container, and then we just print the ID. But let's assume that we didn't. And attach is, as I said before, handled by conmon. Conmon is the parent of the OCI runtime. The OCI runtime didn't double fork, so it's a direct child. And conmon has its standard streams. So what conmon is going to do it's going to open a Unix socket for us, and anything that gets written to the container standard out and standard error, it's going to append a header to it to multiplex it over that socket, and then it's just gonna send it out. And then anything we send to that socket will be written to the container standard in. And the reason we have to do this now and not after the container starts is because this is not buffered. So if we start the container and then attach to it, anything that happens between the start and the attach, we lose it. We could write buffering code, but it's easier to just do this. And now we get to the final step. We are going to invoke the OCI runtime. Podman is going to do it this time, not conmon, because we're just invoking OCI runtime start. And that really is just going to contact that init process that has been sleeping and tell it to wake up and move on to that next step. And that next step is to exec that bash process. And now this is not a fork exec, this is just an exec. We are going to overwrite run C with the new container process, the bash process. And since run C has already set up all these security uh, features for itself, it's already joined the C groups, it's already set up namespaces, we now have PID1 in our container and it started running. Uh, let's see, uh, I think we have a bit of time, so we'll go briefly into this. What happens when the container exits? Conmon is waiting for this. It's waiting on the container's PID, and it's going to save the exit code once the exit actually happens. But it's also gonna do something else. It invokes a command called podman container cleanup. Podman container cleanup is going to take the exit code that, podman, that Conmon stored, because Conmon can't talk to our database. So container cleanup takes the exit code, and it stores it in the database, and then it tears down any remaining container resources. It's going to tear down the network, it's going to unmount the container, and once it's done, we've freed all our resources, and the container is basically done. Uh, one more thing is that if hyphen hyphen rm is given, then the container would be removed at this point. All right, uh, I think that is about it. I know this was a very quick overview and I rushed through a bunch of things, but only 20 minutes. So if you have questions on anything that wasn't clear, questions on anything that you'd like more detail on, feel free to ask. Uh, yes. That is, what? Okay, so I've been asked what happens when conmon gets a PID that is not its child, and that, that is honestly bizarre. I have no idea how that would happen. If you want to open an issue on this one, we'd be glad to hear it, because that sounds very interesting. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so the question is, why use conmon and not systemd? And the answer is largely attach. Uh, we cannot convince systemd to forward what we need from the container, standard streams-wise. Uh, so we really need something to hold open those streams for us 
and to basically forward content to and from the container. That's the big justification of Kanban. And in the end, it's a few kilobytes of memory and basically zero CPU, so we're okay with leaving it around. So the question is comparing Docker and Podman. So briefly speaking, Podman, its goal is to provide a Docker-compatible interface. So our command line front end is going to be basically identical. We've got a few places where we differ, but not many. And we're going to add some features on top of Docker for, from that. We're going to add pod support, for example, and generate play or generate cube, play cube. But we're also going to do this in a manner that is daemonless. We have no daemons. Uh, so there is no process that is waiting in the background and managing the containers, aside from Kanban, which dies the moment the container does. So we are lighter weight and potentially more portable because of that. I think that's a good summary. Uh, any other questions? So the question is, on image pull, what decides the order that we pull the potential candidate images? And it's pretty simple, the order that they're defined in registries.conf. So we have a list of search registries in registries.conf, and we'll try those in the order they're listed. Yes? So is that the exit code gets stored, but where does it actually get stored? Uh, we're going to make a file, and then we're going to write the exit code to it. And that's going to be in a temporary directory just for the container. So container storage, in addition to mounting up the container, it makes us a few directories that we can store files related to it in. And we will throw the exit code in one of those. And we will, when we read the file back, we know basically where it is. It's named with the ID of the container. And the contents of the exit code and the time that it was created is the exit time. Yes. So the question is how CATA containers are different from the other OCI runtimes. And the biggest thing is going to be we didn't need to make a virtual machine here. Uh, CATA containers is VM-based, so it's going to need to spin up a virtual machine. And once it's done that, it is actually, so they do a VM per pod, which is actually rather interesting. I believe they're still doing some of the things we do, like namespacing within those VMs. But they need to spin up a VM with the root file system from the container. I believe right now they're using Device Mapper to manually share it between uh, host and container. Uh, there are other ways, like VertIOFS or 9P. But the big thing here is CATA runs inside a virtual machine. And I believe it's still doing some container things inside that VM. But they're separated by a separate kernel instead of just using the same kernel. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. So the question is non root podman advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is definitely security. You are running with absolutely no capabilities besides one set UID binary, which isn't even part of us. That's, uh, I think, core utils or shadow utils. Anyways, uh, no privileges and can be run basically anywhere it's configured because of that. Any user can run it without worries. Disadvantage, definitely speed because we are using a fused file system. We are having to manually shuttle traffic into and out of the container. I'd say another disadvantage is also you can't do some things that you normally would be able to. Podman, for example, can normally make NFS volumes. No privileges to do that as rootless. So there are some things that you just cannot do without root. But yeah, advantages are security, disadvantages, can't do a few things, and slightly slower. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I'm doing a lightning talk in about a half hour. Come to that, you will be happy. <laughs> uh, anything else? <laughs>
Never mind, we are out of time. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>